you would like to make your copy of scripture ready, we will be in Luke chapter 13 today. Well, something sad happened this week uh, that turned happy. I got um, a statement in my inbox for the internet bill at home, and it went up $20 a month. I was like, well, that's not nice. So I called them, uh, got a representative on the phone, and the representative was like, yeah, well, you may have forgotten because it's been two years, but you actually entered into a promotional deal. And so I have no idea why, but they're like, it was actually cheaper two years ago to add a landline. I was like, those things exist. Um, but we added a landline that's never been used. Because why would you use that? I don't know. But we added a landline, and it actually made our internet bill lower. Um, but that promotion, after two years, had expired. And so my bill went up $20. And so the representative was just like, I'm sorry, Mr. Franklin. We don't have any promotions currently. There's nothing I can do to help you. And I was like, all right, well, I'll take matters into my own hands. I'm going to cancel that voice line that I never use, and that'll save me at least a few dollars. And so I'm in that process, and she's like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to send you over to cancellation to set up the, the cancellation of your voice line. I'm like, okay, well, that's fine with me. So they transfer me to the canceling service, um, and guess what the first thing the lady in the canceling service says? Well, Mr. Franklin, actually, if, if you're willing, I have a promotion here where you can have a landline. <laughs> and get this, we're gonna double your internet speed and you're going to pay less than you've been paying for the last two years. <laughs> the other lady said there was nothing. That sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, and it just reminds me that you know this to be true. Sometimes it matters entirely who you talk to. Sometimes it matters entirely who you talk to. You just need the right person. And we'll see that today. Um, we are in the midst of our series going through Luke, and we're kind of in a portion within the series where we're focusing on the fact that Jesus went back to his hometown, Nazareth, and he got up in the synagogue. So these are all the people who watched him grow up, and he reads from Isaiah's scroll. And he's reading Isaiah 61 as we know it, and he reads this portion where this is what he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He reads that. And he's like putting the scroll back together, rolling it back up, and he says, today in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. What? <laughs> what a claim. Like you're saying that all of the promises of the Messiah, this, this has now come to fruition in our hearing, in our midst. And what do they do? They reject him. They drive him up a cliff or up a hill and try to throw him off a cliff, but he walks through the crowd and goes on his own way. But in saying that, in reading this passage from Isaiah, he's saying, this is my mission. This is why I have come. And so we are going week by week looking at the different claims in that. And so last week we talked about how he came and preached good news to the poor. And so this week we want to look at how he said, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. So as we look through the rest of the Gospel of Luke and we see instances of Jesus actually doing these things, today we look in Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10, where Luke records an instance where Jesus is again in a synagogue and he releases a captive. So will you read with me as we go to Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10. As he, being Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. So Jesus is in a synagogue again. So remember, these are like local houses of worship, so to speak. So from the Babylonian exile, these kind of local congregational spaces where you're like, you can gather, come about. And so they would have religious teachings. On the Sabbath, every day, the community would come together and there would be prayers. They would recite the Shema. They would um, have some reading from the law, reading from the prophets. Someone would come up as long as there were 10 male elders present and they would give some kind of an instruction off of the passage that was read. Um, there would be a benediction, a blessing, and all this stuff. And so Jesus is one of those contexts, again, in a local synagogue. And as he's, he's there, he's teaching, a woman is present. And this woman is apparently at least some years along in life because for 18 years, she has been disabled by a spirit. And look at verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. Sometimes, 
You just need to encounter the right person. And she just encountered the right person. I love how this comes about. That Last week, we look at a couple individuals who come, Jairus, and then the, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And both of them have come to Jesus for healing, one very publicly and one trying to come privately, but Jesus makes it a public thing. And yet here we see he's in a synagogue and there's a lady present, but she's not necessarily there to come for healing. She's just present. Jesus sees her. Jesus initiates this. And Jesus tells her she's been freed from her illness, from her ailment, from her disability. She has been freed. He has released her. And then he comes and he lays hands on her and she's healed in an instant. And so we read that and and our just very logical minds are like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, why did he say she's free from her disability? And then he actually goes to her and puts his hands on her and heals her. Like, well, we separate the two out. And yet, Luke is showing us something actually beautiful in this, that when God speaks, it's as good as done. And so these two are actually contemporaneous. That Jesus says, you have been freed. You're healed. And then he actually goes and physically does this. They're essentially the same. You need to know this. When God says something, it is as good as done. He will see it come about. He has the power to do this. Jesus clearly has the power to do this in this moment. And look at verse 14. After everyone just witnessed this, Jesus sees this lady doubled over. She can do nothing to straighten herself up. She's been bound by a spirit for 18 years plus. Jesus sees her, heals her, announces this. Remember, he's the teacher. It's like everyone's got their attention on him. And now, but a leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys just saw that? I saw it too. Here's the thing. Jesus aside, listen. It's the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. It's in our law. God gave us a law that we are to rest and do no work on this day. We're to remember him. We're to honor. We're to make this a holy day unto the Lord. Don't you come here for healing on the Sabbath? There's six other days in the week when you could come here to be healed. <laughs> like, could you imagine being there hearing that? And Jesus, having just done this, listening to this guy, addressed the whole crowd, telling them, it is the Sabbath, <laughs> you rule breaker. He's not addressing him, he's addressing the crowd. So you can just imagine his like, passive aggressive way, like, doesn't that just irk you? <laughs> Jesus sitting there. He won't address Jesus. He'll tell the crowd, six days out of the week, this would be totally cool, but not today. What are you doing? Healing on the Sabbath day. <laughs> There is spiritual oppression in life. And there is actually religious oppression in life, if you haven't noticed. And you see, there are both of those. There's spiritual oppression in this life because of the curse of the fall. That we sinned, all of us together with Adam, we fell as a race of humanity. We fell in that we are all active participants in that. And we see that if you don't believe that it's imputed and that we are all present in that, you see it in your own life every day that we are sinners. It's our nature. And the result of that is this curse that God pronounced in the garden, Genesis chapter three, that death is coming your way. In fact, you're gonna experience death in so many ways. There's physical death, but more so, there's this spiritual death that you have been alienated, you've been separated from God, the source of life. So there's this divide between us where now we are actually at enmity with God. We are the enemy of God. We're living in an act of rebellion against God. And there is consequence for that. In fact, it's not just in us that we feel the brokenness inside of us. We experience physical brokenness, like this lady who's literally physically bent over and cannot stand up straight. We have sickness. We have death. We have all kinds of physical ailments. And we see also in the world around us the brokenness of the planet. There's natural disasters and all these things that are not supposed to be such. And so according to Paul in the the letter he wrote to the church in Romans, he says that creation itself is groaning, groaning, waiting, waiting for the day of our redemption because we brought this on it. 
And so there is absolutely spiritual oppression that we can live under. And it can affect not just the spiritual, but they actually come together so much. And we, with our postmodern, like highly enlightened minds, we do not like to think about things outside of what we can put in a laboratory and replicate. But the truth is, the spiritual realm affects the physical realm. So like this lady, who is physically doubled over and cannot stand up straight, and Luke says it's because a spirit has done this. A spirit has disabled her for 18 plus years. And so there is absolutely spiritual oppression, the sin and the curse that brought it on us, but this is the spiritual and the natural realms being affected. But then there's the religious oppression, the legalism. We talked about through our entire study through the book of Galatians, our tendency to lapse back into religious performance that it just seems to be much more natural to us to think I've got to earn my way somehow. I've got to measure up and then we impose that kind of standard on others and it becomes this legalistic culture to where it's all about behavior and performance. Whereas the gospel is you could never perform well enough. You're dead and dead men cannot make themselves alive. You came alive by the spirit, now live by the spirit. And that means, yes, your life will change. It means give credit where credit is due. Give glory to God. He did this and he is doing this and he will finish this. And you live free in light of that. But religious oppression comes in and starts to inflict all of that shame and all of the weight of expectation and performance back on you. And that's what's happening here. This guy, this leader of the synagogue gets up and he's like, wait, 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 wait. That was super gracious. That's not us. Do what is lawful. You remember the law? Not today. You don't work today. This is legalism. Um, sometimes legalism looks like knots. Have you ever heard, heard the, the adage, if you can't tie a knot, tie a lot? Yeah? Just taught you something. <laughs> You're welcome. My dad, my dad used to say that, but he would say that because um, that's just unacceptable because he's really good at tying knots. I am not. And there's something in my brain where I just cannot remember how to tie these fancy knots that he's so good at. And so he would get so frustrated with me. We'd be tying up things like the boat or whatever it is, and, and I would just like, I forgot. And so I would go back to, if you can't tie a knot, you tie a lot. You know what? So I just do the same little loop-de-loop -loop thing here and here and here and here and add another one on top of it. And you're like, I still am not fully confident that's going to hold, so I'm just going <laughs> to tie another one. You know? And that's legalism. It's never enough to just say, here's the line. It's like, here's the line, but you know what? You may cross that line, so I'm going to make another line here. You might cross that one. So just to be safe, I'm going to make another line here. And we just add layer upon layer upon layer. And what does all of it feel like? It's this weight that we cannot carry. It's this oppression. It's that guy standing there. Jesus just healed a lady who's been doubled over for 18 plus years. And you say, not today. The law says, we're going to rest on the Sabbath. Six other days out of the week, you guys could have come here. Come on those days to be healed. Like, you just missed a miracle. You just missed the freeing of a lady who's been captive. And you're upset because somebody didn't do what you think they should have done in the moment. You missed the beauty because of the weight of the law in your own heart that you're now inflicting on others. Like, what a tragedy. But here's the thing. The law was truly given from God. And so we can't just, be like, oh, the law is irrelevant. It was just this harassing thing, this, this weight that was put on us that we could never bear. Like, no, the law is actually beautiful. As the psalmist would say, David would say, like, the, your law is my delight. I like, delight in your law. We should feel the same way about the law. The law expresses God's standard of holiness. You cannot mistake the fact that God is truly holy. He is perfect, and what he expects is actually the law. God expects holiness of us. He expects perfection. He expects obedience. This is actually the standard of God, the law. We must live up to it, or we are separated from God. You need to feel the weight of that. We should feel the weight of that, and that should cause a right sense of shame and guilt that I have missed the mark, God. I do not live up to your standard of holiness, your expectation of me. The law truly demands this, and we truly fail in living up to it. But this is where the gospel comes in. 
but God knows we could never live up to it. And now it functions beautifully to show us that we could not do this on our own. So stop trying to live by the law and measure up in some way to earn God's favor. You cannot do it. But he gives it freely in grace, in mercy, in profound love. He says, I will do it for you. This is what Jesus is doing. He is obeying the law every bit of it. He is fulfilling it. He is the fulfillment of it. This is why he said, I came not to abolish or get rid of the law, but to fulfill it. He fulfilled it for us when we cannot. He lived a sinless life. He met the mark. He is the standard of perfection. He is the very holiness of God, the exact expression of God the Father seen in Jesus the Son. Jesus never failed. He lived according to the law when we cannot And then, having been sinless, he died the death that you and I deserve because we do not meet God's standard of righteousness. And he freely gives us his righteousness when we put our faith in him, repenting, turning from our sin. See, confess, Jesus, you are Lord. And I'll trust you for salvation. You died in my place and you rose again, having conquered sin and death so I can live with you forevermore. This is the gospel. But we cannot jump to the end of that gospel and see just how beautiful it is without first seeing that like, no, God really does have a standard and we fail to meet it. But then how insane for us to see the beauty of grace and then slip back in like the leader of the synagogue in this moment and say, no, 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 no. I see what you just did there. I see the power there, but you know what? There's a rule. Six days, you could come here and this would be great. I'd be clapping with everyone else. But today, live by the rule. And so what does Jesus do in response to this guy? Look at verse 15. But the Lord answered him and said, hypocrites, doesn't each of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he had said these things, All his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. This is masterful argumentation. It's exposing the hypocrisy of this man who's trying to live by the law and impose that oppression, that religious oppression on others, rather than celebrating the miracle of grace and the power of Jesus, who Luke calls here the Lord. This is remember. A remembrance of, like for me, a remembrance of how I just love to tie lots of knots. Don't you? In your life, the expectations of performance that you put on yourself, on your spouse, on your coworker, on your friends, on your children. Lots of knots here. Lots of knots here. You're bound to this. You're bound to this. And all this, all this weight. We love to tie them. And you need to know this. Like, they're not all wrong, but like, just get this. Jesus loves to untie knots. You see how he's untying so many knots here. He calls her a daughter of Abraham. This is masterful because they're in a Jewish synagogue. Everyone in this room is going to know because they're Jewish people. They're in the synagogue. They've come here for worship. They're going to know what it is to be a daughter of Abraham, to be a child of Abraham. Like that was one of the things that they loved to say. We are the children of Abraham. And why was that such a big deal? Because that means that all the promises given to Abraham and his offspring, I now receive. Oh, they're mine. What a privilege to be a child of Abraham. And Jesus reminds them, this is a daughter of Abraham. You seem to have forgotten. She's a recipient of the promises. Remember all those promises to Abraham. You remember how they were based on just the fact that he had faith? Not his merit. Just... It was a gift. It was a gracious gift. I promised him these things. She is too also a recipient of the promised blessing. This would reestablish her as a co-heir of these promises. And the Jews, so proud to be called children of Abraham, and it was though they forgot that she is one of them as well. And now Jesus calls attention to it. And she's one of you. Remember that? And now if she's one of you, can you put yourself in her shoes? Beloved, can you put yourself in her shoes? Wouldn't you like to be free today? Wouldn't you just love to not bear the weight of the spiritual oppression, the religious oppression, the oppression you place on yourself, the standards that you hold others to that you can't even hold up on yourself? Wouldn't you love to be free today? 
And you just imagine the room as he says that, it kind of clicking for them. Oh, what have we done? This lady, she comes here regularly. We don't even talk to her because you know, she's doubled over like this. Have you seen somebody with their head down? Why do, you, why do you see people with their head down? It's the posture of shame. When someone, hair in their eyes, hat, the hoodie down, doubled over, staring at the ground, it's like textbook definition of the posture of shame. To turn inwardly, to hide from others. Like, I don't want other people to even realize that I'm here. And so I'll just live in this world like I'm not actually a part of that world. And this lady is physically bound into such a posture. She has been held captive into such a posture, this down and inward posture of shame, a desire to be unseen. And she has no choice in that. And the crowd seems to accept and live by that posture. Just ignore her. And what does Jesus do? He won't ignore her. She didn't even come asking for help. But as he sees her, he calls attention to her. Woman, you are free. You are free. He puts his hands on someone that would for so many years just go unnoticed. He touches her. He heals her. And then in the presence of everyone, he says, remember she's a daughter of Abraham? She's one of you. You've allowed her to live in hiding and just a default posture of shame. And then you would, would challenge whether or not she should be released today? Wouldn't you want to be free today? She is the daughter of Abraham, the promises of grace. Jesus wouldn't allow her to continue. He wants you to be seen in all the things that bring us shame and we turn downward and inward and don't want to be seen. Jesus shows up and says, I'm gonna call attention to you. I want you to remember you belong here and you need to be known in this community. You need to know that you were loved. I love you, and they will love you. Guys, don't forget, no one should come here, ever. No one should come encounter beloved church and not be seen. So look, look around. Make sure everyone knows you're seen here. You're loved here. You belong here. Jesus wants to break that pattern. No, don't live in your shame and your despair. Pick your head up. You're free. There's freedom in the gospel. Jesus comes to free us. This lady has been disabled by a spirit. And some of you may have noticed there's a footnote in most translations there. Um, there's, if you translate this literally, it can be just a, a spirit of disability. And so it begs the question like, okay, this is weird. Like you already got into some weird waters earlier when you said like this spiritual realm affects the natural realm and like we like to divide them up and it's really not that clean. And so what's the deal here? Like, is it really like a spiritual thing or does she just have some kind of physical abnormality, a, a deformity? Like she's just hunchbacked. Like we know hunchbacks. Like this is a thing. She has some kind of degenerative disease in her spine. Like what could have been any of that? And yet Jesus says she has been bound by Satan. So now there's no question. This is absolutely the spiritual realm affecting the physical realm. Some ailments and conditions are actually because of demonic affliction. If that makes you uncomfortable, it should. But you should rejoice, child of God, and you should stand tall and say, like Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so you cling to God and his power, the spirit of God sealing us. He is with us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is with us. God, the spirit, is with us. Remember that. You don't need to be afraid. Your Lord has freed you. Jesus has conquered sin and death. What is clear from the story is that not all bondage is simply physical. Some is and some is not. But Jesus can free it all. And so will you let him, will you ask him, will you receive that freedom today? What kind of bondage are you actually bearing the weight of right now? What did you come here with? Because we all came here with something that we're holding. Where do you feel like you're just tied up in some knots? And you just so want to hear Jesus say, you're free. I put my hands on you and you're free. What are you carrying the weight of? Are you crushed under the weight of sin that has a death grip on you? Your sin actually does lead to death. Do you need to know that there's forgiveness and freedom in Jesus? That he came here. 
gentle and lowly. He came here to help those who could not help themselves. He comes to offer you freedom because he loves you and grace. You don't deserve this, and he gives it freely. Do you need to be free today? Call out to Jesus. He's the one who can free you. Are you crushed under the weight of your own expectations? Just, I fail, and I fail, and I fail, and I'm just crushing myself. That Why can you not live up to it? I'm going to be honest with you, I sat three rows back this morning praying. And as I'm praying, I'm just praying over and over like, God, be here. Be present in a miraculous way. Free people. God, would you give the gift of faith today? Would you help sinners to see that you're a savior for sinners, that you love us in grace and you have real wrath and we should fear you and yet we love you because you love us. I'm praying all these things for you. I'm praying specifically for you as many names as I can think of and faces. I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you and suddenly it hits me as God says, Kevin, what about you? Like what if, what if just you need to be free today, Kevin? And maybe you can relate to that. It's so easy to think about everyone else and their freedom. And yet, what do I do crushing myself? What expectation do I have on myself? And yet Jesus comes to us personally. He wants you to be free. Maybe it's the weight of your spouse and their demands, your boss, education, your team, I don't know what it is, but there's so many things that we allow to tie so many knots. All of these things where your performance is just causing you so much anxiety and to feel so much bondage, whether it's here or there or everywhere. And yet there is freedom in Jesus because Jesus knows you. Jesus is the omniscient God with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All of them are one, and yet these three persons, Jesus knows it all. He died saying, it is finished as the omniscient, divine son of God, he knew you before you were created and he loved you. Paul says at one point, those he foreknew, he did also predestine. That foreknew idea is that he knew you personally. Not just what you would do in your life, but he knew you as a person intimately. He knew what you would do, yes, and yet he loves you. He loves you. So all of your failures from the past, and right now, as you fail today, and tomorrow, and every year to come. He died knowing it all. He has the best expectations ever because he knows exactly what to expect. You will not catch him off guard. And yet he loves you and is offering you freedom. So will you live in that freedom? You have to see that Jesus can free you. And we are the woman doubled over in bondage. Yes, she was a historic person that this actually did happen. And yet the gospel includes this because we should look at this and say, that's me. This is me living under the weight of sin that enslaves with no ability to stand up, to straighten up at all. But Jesus sees us. Jesus comes to us. We are, in Jesus' illustration, we are the tied up donkey, the tied up ox that would just be wasting away, starving to death, dying of thirst, if someone could just realize the law was not meant to be this oppressive thing, untie the knot and lead me to water. And Jesus comes to do exactly that. He comes saying, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never thirst again. Jesus comes and unties the knot. He is full satisfaction. He is full freedom and he comes to us to free us. And no one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. That's the way Jesus said it in John 6. So will you come to him? And what, as we conclude, is an appropriate response to being freed by Jesus like this woman? Be like her. As Jesus puts his hands on her and heals her and this guy is oh, wait a second. And what is she doing? She's worshiping God. She's giving glory to God. Worship. See the majesty of God, a God who would come and free us. This is an amazing God. 
Remember the, the whole idea of shame association with posture? Well, most, most therapy now includes some physical therapy when, when uh, shame is just really, really strangling us. And a lot of that is posture correction, which is kind of interesting. That, that the mental states that we can live in of feeling shame and so forth, a lot of therapy for that um, includes a therapist actually saying, like, we're going to work through your posture, and they'll typically start low, and you just slowly come up. It's not just a one time, like, hey, stand up straight. There we go. Feel confident? Feel better? Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a process of, of coming up. We hear this in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Hear this? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them and him. You know what rulers and authorities he's talking about there? Spiritual rulers and authorities. The domain of darkness, Satan and the demons, the fallen angels, those who are living in rebellion against God. He's saying, this is what he did. He freed you. When you hated God, he loved you came and he freed you. He took all of your debt and he took it on himself and it was nailed to a cross because Jesus was nailed to a cross and he took all of your sin and guilt on himself. Your shame has been nailed to a cross. The record of debt that stood against you has been nailed to a cross, believer. And in doing that, you know what he did? He brought absolute humiliation to Satan. This is the ultimate taunt. What have you got? You have nothing. You have been defeated decisively. The shame that we like to wear and bear. No, Christian, stand up tall. And that may be a process, but stand up tall. Because the enemy now bears the shame rightfully. Jesus has taken it from us. He sees you. You are free, and you don't need to carry that. Maybe you need to just stay actually in that posture today. I've just... I relent, I have nothing, and I'm broken, God. And I would beg you to stay there until you actually hear the gospel this morning, this good news of a Savior, Jesus, who comes in and says, son, daughter, you're free. Because I have freed you. Nothing that you could do but what I have done. And pick your head up and be like this woman and give glory to God. Worship your heart out. And in worshiping, what does she do? She is vocalizing. She is telling others about the glory of God. I asked you last week in our church family meeting, start telling me stories. I need to hear stories of you being faithful and sharing the faith. Start telling others about the glory of God. Tell them this glorious news. Tell them that you're free and who freed you. We do that. Give glory to God. Remember his gospel. Stand tall. Lift your voice to God. Lift your voice to others about God. And maybe you are not a believer. Maybe you don't know Jesus yet. The invitation is real. In this very moment, turn from your sin and see that you have no power to save yourself, but you have a Savior whose name is Jesus, who died for you, and he rose again victorious over sin and death. The debt has been paid. Put your trust in him. Confess him as Lord. Follow him. And we'll do that together. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you. This is who you are. You're the one who comes into environments where we're carrying so much hurt. And you offer life and healing and freedom. Spirit, would you move, God, convict us, shape us by your gospel. It is not our performance, God, but what you have done for us. Help us to cherish that. Help us to cherish each other as we are reminded that we are all sons and daughters. None of us deserve to be here. You come in grace. Tell us that we belong, that we are fully known, and we're loved despite that. Your gospel is glorious because you are glorious. 
So we praise you. Thank you so much. God, would you bless this church? Would you send us out with missional hearts to be like this lady, to now talk about you, to have walked for so long with our head hung down, but now to lift it up in praise of you so others may know you're the God who frees.